Hi, this is Melani McDonald, and this is the TGIF Business Networking Hangout here on Google+. Plus. Today, my special guest is Dominique Fruchtman. She is a local here in the Coachella Valley, California, this nice desert area where we're sweltering with 20% humidity today. Oh. And uh, <laughs> she is known locally here as the networking queen. And she's got it in her little bar down there. So Dominique, give yourself a little introduction and tell us a little bit about all the great groups that you are in and why you're called the networking queen. Okay, well, I really believe that person to person, in person, face to face networking is a wonderful resource for getting business, especially for the kind of business I have. I, my husband and I repair computers, and when somebody lets you work on their computer, that's a huge show of trust. And in order to gain that trust, they have to feel comfortable with you. And I find in person networking to be one of the best ways to get business and cost effective because it's my time which while valuable is not a billboard or a phone book ad or anything else. So that's that's my take on networking and I spend about four to six hours of every workday networking which makes my work days sometimes 12 or 14 hours long. Wow, that's long. And I know you uh, have been a very good public speaker. She's one of my, she's in fact my mentor at our Testmasters meeting. And also I've attended your workshop, How to Create a 30 Second Commercial. Tell us a little bit about that and why is the 30 second commercial so important in business networking that, that's and what's used? That's an excellent question. Your 30 second commercial, or some people call it an elevator speech, is really critical and it answers the question, what do you do? And if you can't hook somebody in 30 seconds, which is about the average length of a television ad, you're probably not going to hook them at all. The most important thing to remember is that nobody cares about you or your boring business. They want to be entertained. They, wanna, they want it to be about them. So the trick is to hook them in with something interesting to them and once you've got them hooked then they're talking about themselves. A good example I like to use is people say what do you do and I say well I repair computers and they go uh-huh and then I launch into a little story because people love stories. I'll say last week I saved a couple's wedding photos the only copies they had by fixing their broken hard drive. And then I ask them, have you ever had that sick feeling when you thought you lost some data that was important to you? And before you know it, they're talking about themselves. Oh, yes, yes, I remember this time. I thought I lost everything. Now I've got them talking about themselves, but in relation to what I do. Right. You told me uh, a little story, too, about how you were talking about that. And the people were saying, oh, my God, you know, you asked them, was there any time when you wish you had saved your, when you had made a backup? And then they start talking about how they lost a bunch of critical stuff. And that's an opportunity for you to say, well, gosh, it's too bad you didn't have me to call on because I could have saved your critical stuff. And that is, in yeah. your mind, creating value for you. That's true. And it, it, it actually makes me feel bad when people tell me they lost things. The last thing I really want to do is say, you should have called me. But what I do let them know is, hey, I can get you online with some cloud-based storage and we can save that data before anything happens to it. And I explain to them that hard drives are like living, breathing, organic creatures. They only have so much life in them because they have moving parts that will fail. Not if, but when. So if you're if your data is not backed up, you're risking a lot. And I let them know that there are things they can do preventatively. So that way I don't have to make them feel guilty about not knowing me before. Right. And Blair, I bet that for someone like Blair who has a credit repair company, that's his business, that kind of a story comes in really handy because everybody who goes to you, Blair, I'm sure, has some kind of a horror nightmare story. <laughs> If they knew you, and now that they do know you, you can help that from repeating itself. Yep, absolutely. 
And so, so Blair, an idea for you would be when people say, what do you do? You say, well, uh, I repair credit. In fact, last week I was able to get a couple into a new house for the first time because I got their credit score to a certain point. Have you ever been denied something that you really wanted and then get them to launch into their little sad story because everyone has? Mm-hmm. So yeah, and, and what I... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah, I was going to say, when I've been to networking events and I do my 30-second commercial or whatever, elevator speech, uh, I have said short little stories like that. And afterwards, people will come up to me and say, hey, Blair, can I talk to you about my situation? Because it, you know... It, it gets them going, gets their thinking about their own situation. That's right. That's actually very clever. And whether you did that instinctively or because you read it somewhere, it doesn't matter. You're doing the right thing. People love a story. They get hooked on yeah. soap operas. They're going to get hooked on your little stories, too. And they're going to relate it to themselves. So, But what you're saying, Dominique, is that when you're telling your little story, it's really an opener that you're then going to ask them a question and start talking about their story, right? That's related to exactly what happened in the business that you provide a service for. Right. And getting them to talk about themselves. People, most people don't realize, unless they're really into sales, which I'm not, but I do recognize that most people's favorite subject is themselves. They really, really, truly don't care about what you do. But if you can make it interesting to them or relatable to them, suddenly they'll feel a connection. And uh, it'll make you a warmer presence to them. Because now you're caring about something important to them. Right. And they like hearing about their stuff. So let me ask yes. you this. There's a lot of networking mixers that the chambers put on around here that are breakfasts or lunches. And they go around the tables and they give you a, a microphone and you get to stand up and talk for 30 seconds or a minute and give yourself a little promo. Oh, which reminds me, I have to give everybody down here a promo too. Um, we'll do that in a minute. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see people make when they're doing their introduction or their promo? And what are some tips that you have for all of us as small business owners on how to do that well? Well, another fantastic question. I'm actually going to demonstrate one of the worst things you can do right now. I'm going to say, good evening, everyone. Now, are you going to say good evening back? Go ahead. Um, good, good evening. evening. Yeah. And we've just wasted 10 seconds of my 30 seconds. So one of the first things not to do, don't say hello because people don't, and don't say hello and then pause and wait because then people will start to mutter in their responses and waste half of your time just saying an awkward hello. Smile when you deliver your commercial or your elevator speech and that hello or good evening will be in will be part of you and you'll be warmly greeting everyone. So do not, one of the things I don't recommend is don't say good morning at a breakfast, don't say good evening at a mixer, don't say good afternoon at lunch. You've just wasted two to four seconds of your time and some of these places are strict and they will, they'll ding you, they'll ring a bell and make you embarrassed that you went over. One of the best things you can do is practice and rehearse and Feel like it's a performance because it is. And another piece of advice is to fake confidence whether you feel it or not because you will project confidence if you can just fake it and then people come up to you and say, oh, you're so confident and never tell them they're wrong because they've just paid you a compliment. <laughs> so let's hear an example of how to do it right. Give us your 30 second. Okay. I usually start out by asking everybody to give me a big moo on the count of three, like a cow. One, two, three. Moo. <laughs> and I tell them, the reason you just mooed for me is because I'm Dominique Fruckman, owner of Desert Cow Computers. That's right, Desert Cow. We serve the entire Cowchella Valley. We don't milk you. We steer you in the right direction for technology. And you can farm out all your needs to us. We, we are the serious geeks with the silly name. We will fix your computer, and that's no bull. 
I'm Dominique Fruckman with Desert Cow Computers. Yay, that's great. Love it. Okay. Thank you. Now it helps that I have a it helps that I have a good business name to be able to make jokes and be memorable. I love the Calchala Valley. <laughs> Most people like we might have to explain for Blair that we live in the Coachella Valley, which is C O A C H E L L A, but I make it the Couchella Valley. And one time someone came up to me and said, You know you're pronouncing it wrong, right? <laughs> I said, Yes, I know. Thank you. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> well, I hope you guys were paying attention because I am now going to turn it over to you to do your 30 second premise, which I usually let people do in the beginning and I kind of forgot. So I'm just going to go left to right. So Blair, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, I'm going to be talking quiet because I got people on both sides of me over here studying. But uh, I am down here in Texas. As you said, Dominic, your favorite Texan. <laughs> um, I do, I own a uh, a credit restoration company and what we do is we help people improve their credit scores and usually it's for some reason like to uh, buy a house or a car or something so they're also trying to get qualified and I work very closely with uh, mortgage uh, loan officers and bankers and realtors so if you uh, know anybody that might need credit help then have them come to Blair for credit repair oh that's good, good. <laughs> we already heard Dominique so now we'll go to Marisa Wilman all right um, I've actually been typing furiously trying to incorporate everything that Dominique has been teaching us but it's not polished yet so I'll just give you the down and dirty. Uh, my name is Marissa Wellman. I'm a copywriter and content marketer and I help my clients by providing them with words that sell and I work with small to medium sized businesses as well as uh, digital marketing firms to provide website content, blog posts, press releases, just about anything that works with words. That's great. That's really good. Yeah, Dominique, give us the critique of these two. I thought <laughs> well, they were really, really good. Well, I thought I liked Blair's a lot because he explained exactly what he does and he wasn't boring. And that's another thing is don't be boring. That's a little hard to quantify sometimes. So in Blair's case, it was interesting because he was telling me that people usually have a goal. And I'm a very goal-oriented person, so that resonated with me. And I would have gone up to him and said, how long does it take? How long do I need to plan? Like, do we need to start working together six months or a year before I want this car or house? And I would start asking him things because he intrigued me. Marissa, you were great. That words that sell, the way you emphasized it and slowed it down was great. And it, it was really put the emphasis on what we all want to do, which is to sell. And I would like to see you at near the end, focus on one thing. You mentioned several things you do, and one of the problems with mentioning several things is that people often remember none. Now, I know you a little bit, so I know that you do website content. I would focus on, like, maybe say two things. I'll help you come up with website content and the, the words to use in your brochure or something like that, maybe two things. And then the next time you give the commercial to that same group, say, I'll help you design, decide what to put on the front of your business card and maybe one other thing. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. It does. That's a lot easier than trying to rattle off everything in hopes that one thing will resonate with them. <laughs> right. And when you rattle things off, people are trying to play catch up and it usually is not effective as saying one thing and usually most people are smart enough to think well she does website content I bet she can help me with my brochure too because your emphasis was words that sell and that's your message alright thank you what's your advice Dominique for someone in a service industry that is not well understood for example business brand identity building <laughs> Well, w one of the things we struggled with with you, Melani, was trying to get people to understand exactly what the heck it is you do. And only when they saw you in action did they really get it. It took a two-hour workshop for the workshop attendees to, at the end, finally go, 
oh, I get what you do because you were cleverly helping them come up with little slogans or turns of phrase that that appealed to their brand or helped emphasize their brand. I think when we changed your name to Business Identity Brand Consultant, it made it a lot clearer than what you used to have, which was Outreach Consultant, which means something to the nonprofit sector and the public sector, but it means nothing to us simple small business folks. Right. So when you say you're going to build my brand, that tells me that you're going to make me memorable and make me stand out in the crowd. So, you know, that to me says a lot. And getting that title for you was not an easy task. I think it took us four hours to come up with two, two full classes. Well, you know what? Speaking of those workshops, that's one of the things that I actually learned from you was that attending business-oriented workshops, workshops that people are presenting for small business audiences, whether it was a topic that I needed to learn or not, one that was already out, that I'm already familiar with. Those were a perfect networking venue for me because when I go to those workshops, usually there are group activities. The group usually does some brainstorming on behalf of everybody involved. And you get to actively participate. And as you said, it was when they really see me kind of in action that they start to understand what it is exactly I do in my consulting. And going to those workshops has given me really positive networking returns. I've gotten a couple of clients out of people that I met, business owners that I met from other people's workshops, a couple of them being your workshops. That's why uh, you'll see me at all your workshops, and even though I already went once. <laughs> so what you are, mean five or seven times. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some other really great avenues for networking besides the traditional chamber mixers that everybody knows about? Uh, where, one where, of my... One, go ahead. Oh, one of my favorite ones is to check out meetup.com in your area and do a search for the word networking or business and see what groups there are in your area. We have a group here locally called Chicks That Click, which is a women's business networking group where we support each other and brainstorm for each other and we take turns focusing on one member per meeting and just putting all our collective energies toward them. I think it's a great concept, and I wish there were more groups like that out there. But Meetup is a great place to start, no matter where you are. And uh, Marissa, how about yourself? You uh, told me recently that you're kind of just getting your feet out there with the networking groups. Have you found any venues as of yet that you found to be uh, more working for you for copywriting for your services, your business to business services? Um, you mean in terms of in-person networking? In-person networking, right. Yeah, you know, and we were kind of talking about this at the last Chicks That Click meeting, and really it's any networking event where it's a small, smaller group, you know, some of the chamber mixers we have in the area, there's maybe 500 people that show up, and they all kind of hang out with the same old people and they're not really there to mingle. So it's always, I, I like the smaller groups like Chicks That Click, you know, maybe there's about 10 ladies um, or the, the lunches that one of our local chamber puts on, um, you know, and that's limited to 15 people. So I prefer those, the smaller ones where you can really make a connection because so much of, of the business relationship is going to be based on that relationship and that connection that you're able to forge. And going to a meeting where there's 500 people, you know, what kind of relationship are you possibly going to make? Right. If I, could, if I could just throw something in there to, to ride coattail on what Marissa just said. Here, I have one tip for you, Marissa. If you know you have to go to an event or you promised yourself you're going to attend an event where hundreds of people will be there, my best advice is get there a half an hour early. What you're going to do is run into the first 50 people that come. And it will be like its own little half-hour networking group. And then when the regular crowd starts flooding in, you can take off because you've probably connected with two to four people, which is really a good goal for any networking opportunity. If you 
come away with two to four business cards or you gave away two to four business cards in a genuine way where the person actually wanted it and asked for it and you weren't just shoving it down their throat, which is not good networking etiquette, you've succeeded and you can go home. Well, that's, that's excellent advice. advice. That is really good advice. And, you know, that's funny because in thinking about this, and I think it's important that anybody out there who is starting with their networking efforts, go to a variety of events and see which ones you click with personally, which ones appeal to you. Because like Marissa, I like the smaller ones. And I also like the ones where people stand up and they do their 30-second promo because it gives me an opportunity to introduce myself to the room. It also gives me an opportunity to listen to everybody else and see what they do so I can sit down and say, oh, that's a potential client, that's a potential client, that one will never need my services. So it gives me a chance to figure out who I want to zoom in on during the course of the meeting. And those large mixers where everybody is just kind of standing around and mingling, I just do not know how to handle those well. I, I, <laughs> I am not comfortable just walking up to the strangers because everybody seems to, even though we're all going there to network, it seems like everybody ends up standing in their own little circle of friends that they went there with or that they know or that they're comfortable with. And I don't see a lot of mingling. Now, that's a case-by-case -case basis because I know Andy, for example, loves those kinds and he doesn't like the 30-second ones where you're at a table with people. He's like, I'm here to mingle. I want to meet everybody. <laughs> so, um, any advice? Well, I, I have some advice. Yeah, actually, I do. I like to, in my 30-second in my commercial workshop, one of the pieces of advice I give is keep it real. We had a guy named Andy, coincidentally, who was our credit card guy. But on his business card it said merchant processing sales associate or something that completely put me to sleep. I said, no, you're the credit card guy and that's who people are gonna that's what people are gonna say behind your back and the ones that are comfortable that with you to your face. So keep it real. If you're uncomfortable at a networking event, why don't you walk up to a little clique of four people and say hey, I'm new here, who can you guys introduce me to? And just be completely in their face and take them by surprise. Be real, don't be embarrassed or shy. Just expect them to be ambassadors for that organization and help you out. And most people who are huddled together in a little mass of four or three or four people probably are regulars. And it is their duty to be able to help you out. So keep that in mind when you feel intimidated at a group. Walk up to some people and just say, what can you do for me? Got that, Marissa? I think you and I Got next it. time we'll have to go together and uh, support each other while we try that out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for all this excellent advice on networking mixers. I want to talk a little bit about now a different kind of networking, and that is referrals. It is a you... Dominique, and your Desert Cal computers kind of dominate on Yelp out here. Yeah. And uh, I don't Yelp. I'm not familiar with Yelp. So tell us a little bit about the value of review sites like Yelp and how exactly is it that you get so many of your customers to make the effort to leave a review? Well, that's a, a, a wonderful question, and now I'm going to start revealing some good secrets. With Yelp, it was it, we live in an area here, and now that it's just us CV gals until someone watches this later, this area it has an older demographic, people who don't have smartphones, people who don't have iPads, and they don't even know Yelp exists. So it's, it was certainly a challenge to become the highest rated computer repair in Coachella Valley, which we are. Last time I checked, we had 10 five-star reviews. Our competition had anywhere from one to two five-star reviews, and one of the big stores down the street had three or four, but their reviews were only three out of five stars. The way I do it is I usually go the extra mile for someone. And right when they're saying, how can I ever thank you for coming right when I needed you or coming 
an hour after I called you or for fixing this little problem and not charging me. I say, well, I'm glad you asked. There actually is something you can do for me. And people are usually very happy to share their effusive praise. And when you catch them when they're in a good mood and when they are feeling generous, that's the best time to get them to write you either an email testimonial that, Marissa, you could tell people to use on their websites or their brochures, or a Yelp type review or a Google Places review or a Yahoo local review. We, I encourage all three. I ask people, who's your email? If they say Gmail, I ask them to write me a Google review and I email them a link. And I have a bit.ly link that I have memorized that I can have them type it in right while I'm still sitting there at their house and say, there's the place to go. Now just hit the review button. So having it convenient and short and easy for someone to do is one of the easiest ways. In particular with Yelp, it's tricky because Yelp has a sophisticated filtering system which uses a complex and secret algorithm. They sniff out reviews that are coerced or paid for or bribed or forced and they filter those reviews. So even though those reviews exist, they're hidden from most people. The trick is to get people who are already Yelp users to review you. The worst thing you can possibly do is have someone sign up for Yelp and that same review you. It's almost a guarantee that your review will get filtered. Which is why I never reviewed you because I don't do Yelp at all. So, <laughs> Well, see here, let me tell you a little trick. If you sign up now and review a couple of health food restaurants you like or Trader Joe's or other local restaurants or places that you shop or even the Kmart down the street, Within six months from now, I'll ask you to review me then because after your account is aged and you have reviewed various different places, I'll ask you to review the car wash or dry cleaners that you use so there are other service industries on your reviews, not just 15 restaurants and then suddenly a computer repair because they look at things like that too. Mm -hmm. And not all five-star reviews, it's a good place to complain. They don't want to see all glowing stuff because nobody's that perfect. I like to review my positive experiences and I think there's only one two-star review that I gave and it was a horrible experience and I was hoping that the owner of the company would learn from it or respond to me. And that's another important thing is to, if you do get a negative review, it's critical that you address it. Other people reading that negative review will say, wow, this business owner actually cares and wrote something like, I'm sorry you had a bad experience, please call and ask for me directly and here's my name and extension and let me make this right for you. And so where do you leave that response, right on, on the same review site in a comment or? Right underneath, right underneath the bad review there's an opportunity for the business owner to leave a remark and most good business owners will check their reviews on a monthly basis and respond to any negative reviews. You know, that's really good advice because when I worked at uh, the water agency, this was something that public uh, agencies and nonprofits and really trends over to, to business side too. There is in those industries a lot of kind of a, a, a leaning towards if somebody says something bad or the public says something bad about you to just ignore it a lot of times because it's easier to kind of ignore it and hope it will go away than to address it which makes a lot of people uncomfortable but being in the public outreach uh, department it was like no 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 this this is an opportunity because if you can get somebody who's left you a complaint and then you address them and then you make it right. In this day and age where customer service really doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people anymore, uh, by people I mean the people on the providing side. There's not as much great customer service as there used to be, it seems like. When people do receive really good customer service, they're usually kind of A, blown away by it, and be so happy to get it that they'll come back and they'll leave a follow-up message that says, man, okay, I had a problem, but they really made it right, and I'm really happy. And then it turns into a good positive review. 
the reviews that are negative are usually left by people who had an issue, went to customer service and tried to get their issue resolved, and just got blank walls. I know that when I, as a consumer, leave a negative review, it's because I first tried to get the problem solved, and then the company basically told me, well, you're just SOL and we don't care. That's when I <laughs> social media. So, you know, addressing it is an opportunity waiting to happen to turn someone who's unhappy into a cheerleader. That's, that's an amazing and such a true statement. You can make, turn enemies into friends by making it right somehow. Now, some people, there's no pleasing them, and that's just unfortunate. But you do the best you can, and you can turn a good percentage of those. Because like you said, most people are honest and frustrated. They've made an effort to get it fixed, and it hasn't. I'd like to tell you a quick little story about a woman locally here who specializes in social media. She gave an example. I went to her lecture two weeks ago, produced by the Palm Springs Writers Guild, and she was teaching a bunch of us writers how to use social media. She gave an example of Twitter. She's a huge Twitterer. I don't Twitter myself. i am just got a lot of balls in the air, and I think that would just be one more, but she's a big fan of Twitter. She had a client who said, guess what, my email address went away because Time Warner said that when you change your phone number, you lose your email address. And she said, what? That's completely crazy. And she wrote this little paragraph on Twitter, a couple sentences, and saying, since when do you lose your email address? Everyone knows they're archived. Time Warner fail. And within 20 minutes of her putting that up, with a hash mark, Time Warner. She got a, a response back on her feed saying, please call Danny at 1-800-something-or-other, extension such and such, and we will handle this immediately. And it's amazing the power of social media for companies that understand, and, and they did, in fact, she did tur completely turn around and she said, wow, I take back what I said, Time Warner came through, good for you guys for watching your feeds and for seeing what people say about you. Yeah, some companies do it really well, especially the airlines. I've had issues with Delta and United, and they are on top of it. I mean, their Twitter accounts are basically just to field complaints, but it, you know, they they do a really good job. And a lot of people that complain, they end up, you know, getting, you know, put on a flight that was supposedly full, or getting a voucher, or, you know, getting a hotel for the night. So these companies that are really taking advantage of it, you know, it's it's such a brand booster. It's like, why wouldn't you do it? Right. Although I sometimes think they do it to the expense of their traditional customer service lines. Because I've had the same experience with, this is with Pantone, and Pantone is this uh, company that puts out these awesome swatch books of colors. So for graphic designers, we use those a lot. We need specific colors or whatever. And, you know, I was on the mailing list, and they kept sending me junk mail in the mail, paper mail, and you know me, I'm like the tree hegger, you're killing the trees, stop sending me this stuff, I'm giving you my email address, send it to me in email, I welcome the emails, but I don't want the paper mail. And I went through all their regular avenues of write this address if you don't want to receive it anymore, that didn't work, and then I called, and then I went through this four to five to six times, and finally I got fed up and I went to Twitter with it. And like you said, within a couple of hours, they got back to me on Twitter, they looked into it, and they had somebody remove me from the postal mail database, and I didn't get any more after that. So I love that they're so responsive on Twitter and the social media feeds, but I wish that they were as responsive in their traditional customer service avenues as well. Yeah, you would equate Twitter complaints to houses on fire. Before the house is fully engulfed in flames, why not just take care of it, like you said, through the 800 number or through some other means, then let it become a full-blown four-alarm fire? Because that, when you're on Twitter and saying you're a failure, right. and it's public, it's embarrassing. Even if you do heroically solve the problem, it would be nice if there were fewer problems solved. You're so right. 
But speaking of social media, we all network face-to-face. And face-to-face networking is definitely proven to be the most effective and giving the most returns. What are your experiences with networking in social media? The whole reason I started this TGIF, Business Networking Hangout, on Fridays was because I felt that the Hangouts gave us a way to use social media but still get the face-to-face in there. Because I found making posts is one thing, but you don't get the same kind of interaction as you do face-to-face. But seeing people on camera face-to-face or when you're in a video chat room seems to be as effective. I get relationships built, and I've met a lot of people, and it's really expanded my circles. Uh, I want to hear from both of you on what your experiences have been, if you don't mind. And we'll start with you, Dominique, because you're our special guest. Okay. Well, I'm very new to Google+. I only got into it after I met you, and you and I started doing a lot of networking together, and you really lassoed me and pulled me in. And I see how much value there is and how much you get out of it, and that's made me a big fan. But I'm still a total noob, and it's going to take a little while for me to get my sea legs and find my niche in in this world. However, for... For traditional ways of social media, I can mention that we've, and especially in the last couple of months, what will happen is I'll have a client in real life who I know from, from traditional networking who falls in love with me, and I'm their new favorite person, and they want to tell everyone. Somebody will post on their Facebook timeline, does anyone know a good computer repair? And I've gotten three calls from two different sources. One person referred me twice, and another person referred me once as a result of that kind of Facebook relationship. So my friend tells their friend, but that friend I knew from in person. Okay. So your your online social is more about keeping in touch with people that you've already made a connection with in some other means. Yes. Okay, so and, and who usually who love me like crazy. Okay. And Marissa, how about you? Have you had uh, a lot of experiences with social media networking? Yeah, mostly I focus on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a little better because you can go into groups and it really gives you, if you're targeting the right groups, it really gives you an opportunity to establish yourself as an expert. You know, as long as you're not there solely doing your self-promotion, hey, I'm a writer, hire me, hire me, You know, it's just like anywhere else. No one's going to listen to you. But if you're there and you're providing content and you are informing, you know, your audience, whether that be me, you know, informing business owners, small business owners um, about how they can be marketing smarter, how they can do, you know, how they can do better um, penetration of their markets through their content, that is a great opportunity to establish yourself as an authority. Um, But I haven't done it enough to see the returns and that's that's the downfall is there's so much opportunity for social media networking that how do you make it effective you know how do you figure out where to be and be there enough and consistently enough to see the returns so that's something I'm still struggling with. Dominique uh Thanks, Marissa. Dominique, I have a question from somebody who is posting comments in um, on Google Plus, and this is Pat Ferdinandi wants to know, where do you recommend that business to businesses do our networking? I would say for the most part, go to your local chamber of commerce. If you're living in a suburb, as most of us are, there will be many little cities, and each and every one has their own chamber of commerce. I suggest going as a guest several times, at least two to three times until you get a vibe or a feel for how that chamber is. Some are small and intimate and warm. Others are massive with hundreds of people but offer you a wide variety of people to network with. Others have breakfasts where you get your 30 seconds. Others are just simply mingling fests where you're trying to shake hands with a hot wing in one hand and a cocktail in the other. So 
I would start with the chambers and then try specialty groups, such as if you're Hispanic, see if there's a Hispanic chamber. If you're gay, see if there's a gay chamber. See what niches you fall into. If you're a technologist, see if there's a, a techie group for you. So I think you know you need to find what your niche is and then seek out groups and again use meetup.com as a wonderful resource for specialty groups. I think the online networking kind of works out the same way because Marissa Wilman has found, as you were saying, a lot of great use out of the LinkedIn stuff. And I do LinkedIn too, but it's not as effective for me and probably I'm sure it's because I don't spend as much time there. And that's why I ended up doing so much on Google+. It ended up being the most effective for me. But I know other people who Facebook has been the most effective for them. So I think a lot of it, again, goes with Pay attention to your own personality. Pay attention to being true to what works for you, what makes you feel good, and what you're comfortable with doing. It's when I go to, when I push myself to go to the ones I'm not so comfortable with, more often than not, I come away not feeling that I connected with anybody and that I shouldn't have wasted my time going to this mixer as opposed to when I focus on the ones where I know I'm more comfortable in the surroundings. Do you have any advice for when we're not comfortable? Yes. Getting out of your comfort zone is one of the most important things you can do. But there is such a thing as being too uncomfortable. If, as you said, if Andy hates the 30 second commercial format, he should stay away from that and go to the mixer format. You could try the mixer format with the approach I suggested where you boldly walk up to a group and ask them to help you out. Who, here's what I do. Who can you introduce me to that's good for me since you guys seem very comfortable here. Get a little uncomfortable and see how it does for you. But if after a few times you're not feeling the love, then try another, another chamber, another venue, another mixer, another format. Try going virtual. If you're virtual and that's not you're not loving that, then try going in person. I feel like life is a balance and you need to do a little of everything. But it's where you put your focus and your energy that you're going to get the most return. Melani, you've put so much focus and energy on Google and you're getting wonderful returns and people love you and you have quite a following. And it's because you've made the investment. I go to all of these mixers and chambers and I go to organizations that are obscure, tiny, but I put my time and energy, I spread it pretty evenly. And there are one or two organizations here in the Valley that give me the most return. And I therefore put my most of my energy into that. For example, the Gay Chamber of Commerce here in the desert is called the Desert Business Association org. And they're a wonderful, friendly chamber that's not too big and not too small. I would say they get anywhere from 60 to 80 people per event. And people are warm, and they're not clicky, and they're friendly, and they sure know how to throw a good party. <laughs> Dominique, I have uh, another question. And, and you kind of threw me off because you made me laugh with that last comment. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what my question is now. <laughs> so intently. Um, I can't remember it. I'm sorry. So, uh, <laughs> well, so do you want me to just throw out some general? Do you want me to throw some general mixer etiquette out there? Uh, yeah, and I also wanted to ask if Marissa has any questions because you've been kind of quiet unless I've been asking you anything. Do you have any questions? Any burning things that you wanted to know? You know, I'm I'm here to learn. I've been absorbing everything, so I'm sorry I haven't been talking a lot. I've just been trying to to work on my me speech and kind of see how I'm going to implement everything. I did pull up the Desert Business Association Mixer page. Are they having a mixer next Tuesday? Yes, they are. It's at Encore in Palm Springs, and it should be a really good one. And I'll be there okay. at the door helping people in. So oh, you know, you might want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, before you forget. <laughs> because you said, oh, I'll be at the door, and that's what reminded me. You are such a natural-born leader. 
you hold a lot of leadership positions out here in the various groups in the Valley. You're president of my Toastmasters Club. You're president of the Desert Business Association. You're one of the officers of ABWA. How much Okay, so let me just make a little correction there. I'm, I'm not... I'm not quite president of the DBA. I'm a I'm on the board of the DBA. I just oh, don't want okay. anyone from the DBA to think I'm stealing their their thunder there. My apologies, anybody from the DBA. That was my mistake. <laughs> okay, so you're on the board of the DBA. So my question comes to how much added extra value in networking does it bring to take on these leadership positions? Because once you do, there is a commitment of time and dedication uh, to a lot of events and to things that you have to take care of as an officer or a volunteer or a board member. But does it also bring you increased returns in terms of your networking? Are you doing it for that or is it just really because you have that natural leader personality? I mean, I think you would be doing it regardless. But generally speaking, is it? Yeah. Is yeah. Yeah, you're right. I would do it. Big. Well, yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. When I like, for example, let's take the Desert Business Association, the, the Gay Chamber of Commerce here in the desert. That organization is the single most successful organization in terms of dollars of dollars I've earned for time and money put out, hands down. I can't even. It's. It, it's such a clear, obvious leader that I decided to join the board. I was actually asked to join the board, and I was so flattered and honored after I had recommended to several of my friends, hey, you have to come to this group. It's fantastic. Yeah. So they asked me to join the board, and I did. And by joining the board, at each mixer, the board members are allowed to take the microphone and say their name and their what they do for a living and their board position in front of 80 people. And I believe that that does give me extra exposure. And because of my personality, I'm now doing the door prizes. So they say, and now it's time for door prizes with Dominique. And I make little jokes. I once uh, recently gave away a massage w along with a food gift certificate, and I called it a grub and rub, and I made everyone laugh. And it's fun, it's fun to get that little spotlight for five minutes and give prizes away, and it makes everyone know me and, or feel that they know me so that they're comfortable coming up to me afterward. It's all about whether somebody's going to have the courage or the nerve to come up to you and ask, hey, can you help me with my thing? my lowly little thing. So yes, I believe that those leadership positions do benefit you, but for me, I'm, a, I'm a, in a leadership position of the groups that I love, that I believe in, and that I'm passionate about. You know, that brings up another question. Giving prizes away as uh, donating services or goods. As a small business owner, and especially as a business-to-business uh, service industry, how much return does providing the gift in those chamber mixer raffles that they have every time you go to one of those networking mixers, they do the raffle where they call for the gifts. Uh, how much value do you think there is in being the provider of a gift? That's a, a terrific thing to ask and the answer is depends on what you give. For example, I'm going to use Judy Garvey, who we both know, and I think Marissa just missed possibly knowing in, from Chicks. Judy gave away two hours of her services at a DBA event. And when I give away a prize, I make sure to mention who donated it, what it is exactly, even if that's one or two sentences. So I'll explain. Well, you get two hours with Judy Garvey, interior decorator. She's going to help you transform your home in two hours, and this, this generous gift is courtesy of Blank Canvas Home, and I'll give her company name a plug to help people connect her with her company. As a result of her giving away two hours, someone in the audience later emailed me and said, who was that lady that gave away the decorating thing? I'm looking for a decorator. It turns out the person who won the two hours never used it, but the guy who wrote me, because he knew I was on the board and knew by the virtue of how I explained Judy's gift that I knew her, ended up becoming a very lucrative client for her. 
Oh. So, yeah, it pays off. Oh, awesome. That's great. And um, I'm almost at the end of time. It's 4.50, and we're going to be done by 5. So I want to, at this time, ask you, is there anything in particular that you wanted to address that we didn't hit up yet or that we didn't talk about when it comes to networking? I A couple of things that are should be common sense but probably are not. One is don't drink or be prudent with your drinking when you network. <laughs> There's nothing worse than having somebody laugh and smelling their beer breath or their wine breath or their margarita breath. Also, if you get a little too loosey-goosey at a networking event, you might say or do something inappropriate or less than professional. Your goal there is, sure, have a snack, have a sip of something, have fun, but keep professional and remember that people are looking at you even when you think people aren't looking at you. <laughs> Try to stay away from the messy finger food, the wings, the cheese. Uh, use the toothpicks when they provide them. I like to, if I can, eat before I get to a networking event and just walk around with a Diet Coke or a water in my hand so that I'm feeling like part of the party. But when someone wants to shake hands, I don't get a handful of wing sauce. Right. And, you know, sometimes at those networking mixers, especially the chamber ones, they freak me out a little bit because, you know, we live in an area where we get a lot of uh, retired people and seniors. And sometimes I see these people just going straight for the bar and they're drinking the whole time they're there and it's two hours. And then I think, I'm leaving early because what happens is I think, oh my goodness, I'm all going to be getting in their cars now after they've been drinking all this time and leaving. And I don't want to get the time. Oh, so I try to It's a matter of, of fear for me too when I see that many people drinking and then irresponsibly driving home. I'm, I, I'm really not a fan of that and it does scare me, especially when you see them not even eating anything and they're chugging down one martini after another glass of wine and it, it makes me lose respect for them as professionals as well. So oh, that's just one example of how going straight for the bar can damage you can damage your image. You need to remember that people are judging you all the time, whether they do it consciously or not. And you also have a responsibility to the safety of others not to drink and drive or bring someone with you from your office and let them drive you home. And you can get as plastered as you want. But be a responsible adult and leave early if you see everybody getting hammered. Just take, just take off. Okay. Good advice. Remember it your business brand identity that you are building at all times and how you act That's true. will be part of that. So when is your next workshop coming up? Well, I wanted to have one on August 6th, which is a Monday night, but everyone who expressed interest seems to be either out of town or, or not on email. I don't know. Maybe it's just this week because of the holiday. So I'm going to pursue it. Marissa, if you're interested, there will be you, me, and Melani, at least the three of us for sure. And I've had interest from five other people, but I do limit the class size to a total of eight, not counting myself, but counting Melani. That's the day before my birthday. Woo oh, yay. Yeah. And uh, I, I am going to make one exception, actually, to what you were talking about just now with the drinking of the alcohol. And I made a post earlier, and Blair shared it, actually, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. And that said, you know, maybe on the week of my birthday, the TGIF will be just no special guests, no particular theme, just general networking, and I'm actually going to drink a beer during the networking thing. Oh, so it's happy hour. <laughs> It'll be a happy hour networking thing. So. I love that. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, everything in balance and moderation usually works out. It's, it's your daily habits that make you or break you. Right. That's a good one. Uh, Blair, are you still, you can just nod if, you're, if you can't really talk. Are you still over at Starbucks? And uh, I am. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can. Do you want to say any last words? Say a goodbye as we're wrapping up. Give yourself another little promo. <laughs> another little promo? Today. Well, I thought... We only have four people here, yeah. so we get to talk as long as we want. Well, I will say thank you, Dominic, because uh, networking is one of my favorite topics. I think it's just so important in business. It's, it's you know, like everybody says, it's, it's uh, not always what you know, but who you know, right? And uh, the only way to do it is yes. networking. It really is. Yeah. So well, that's, I knew that's there was a reason comment. you were my favorite Texan. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you? Well, uh, and and oh. well, and then one one other one other little comment is that um, you know some some businesses lend themselves to networking more than others. Like like Melani, everybody needs your business. Everybody. And uh, Dominic, probably everybody needs you at one time or another. But not everybody needs a copywriter or a blogger like Marissa, or not everybody needs credit repair, hopefully, <laughs> or we'd be in sad shape as a nation, right? But um, so I think that is one thing that, that I've discovered is that some of these people go to hundreds of networking groups because everybody they meet is a potential client. I have tried to go to the ones that I know that fit my industry that will give a lot of referrals for my industry, like mortgage related networking groups, realtor related networking groups. Did you you didn't touch on that while I was out from the hangout? Did a you? tiny bit. A little tiny bit. I did mention that you should okay. stick with groups that are within your niche. So for you to mm. network with realtors or mortgage lenders or mortgage brokers or uh, bankers or just about anyone who has clients that need you is this one a really super smart thing to do and I call those power partners and you need mm. to have as many power partners as you can an example a quick example because we're running out of time is uh, our mutual friend Milani's and our my mutual friend Marty she's a desert computer tutor and I am a huge power partner for her because I'll go over to someone's house and fix their computer and then they say how do I do this in Excel and I hand her business card over and I say you know what she's Perfect. way more affordable than Perfect. I am so you have gotta find your person who's gonna be handing your cards out more often than you do and likewise if you do the same for them people are very into reciprocity when you give them a referral they will go out of their way to refer you back most nine times out of ten and that's my final very good word yeah. on the subject <laughs> Okay, well, why don't you give All right. your, uh, your parting 30-second commercial, Dominique. Okay, I'm Dominique Fruckman, owner of Desert Cow Computers. At Desert Cow Computers, we're outstanding in our field, like a lot of cows are. We'll fix your computer, and that's no bull. Serving the entire Cowchella Valley, we're Desert Cow Computers, the serious geeks with a silly name. That's so good. I love standing out. <laughs> We're outstanding in our field. <laughs> okay, I like that. Uh, sorry, you have to follow that. <laughs> I know, I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, how am I going to follow that? Yeah, hi, I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it helps, I've had two years of practice with that one. <laughs> yeah, mine will get better. I've taken a lot of notes today. and I'm going to, it's my homework for the next hangout or chicks that click meeting. I'll, uh, I'll bring something better, but... My name is Marissa Willman. I help my clients by providing them with words that sell. I work with small to medium-sized businesses to provide website content that engages and hooks their clients to bring results. Very hey. good. Very nice. Yeah. It's better than the first one. And it I is think, better. I have to say, I actually think more businesses and small businesses do need copywriting services than people realize out there because as someone who has done public outreach for public agencies, I know how important it is the way you word things. There, one of the examples that I gave in the public agency I worked for, I had to promote water conservation. And when I was writing my water conservation tips column, it was always word it positively. Because if you say, don't, you know, don't wash your driveway out with the hose, 
then you are telling somebody something they can't do anymore and you are taking it, something away from them. When you say instead, sweep your driveway with a broom instead of a hose and you will save money on your water bill every month, then you are not taking anything away from them. You're not telling them don't do this. You're giving them something else to do that's a positive action. And you're also giving them the reward. You're going to save money on your water bill. And you're going to save water for the environment. So you're wording it positively, do this and save money in the environment, versus don't do this because it's bad. <laughs> you know, and you're, giving them, you're also giving them an alternative, which is really clever. That's, that's really clever, Melania, right. and worth the price of admission today. And that's, that's the yep. type of thing that professional <laughs> copywriters like Marissa know and keep in mind. It's very natural in conversation for us to say, don't do this. That's our natural way of speaking. But when you're trying to do public outreach that's effective, whether it's you know, changing habits, uh-oh, we lost our speaker, oh. or <laughs> whether it's changing habits or marketing, you know, something for a, a private business. It's really, really important. And it's 5 o'clock, so I'm the host. I'm going to give you my 30-second commercial now. My name is Melani McDonald. I am a business brand identity consultant with careful planning, creation, and cultivation of your business identity and reputation. We create the strategy that works for you. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in that case, I'll end it there. <laughs> and I notice I also lost uh -huh. my uh, hangout. Yeah, that's good. Oh, she's back. I don't know what happened. It said the server something or other. Is there a computer tech in the house? Yeah, really? <laughs> oh, they're outstanding in their field right now. <laughs> yes, we're outstanding in our field. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> okay, we're tipping cows. Okay. We're tipping cows, yes. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks you for just having me. Goodbye. We'll see you next Friday when the guest is going uh, bye -bye. to be Ronnie Bincer, who is a video leads online as his business. And he is an expert at video marketing and uh, SEO, which is search engine optimization, which just means he knows how to make your videos come up higher in search results. That's great. <coughs> I enjoyed uh, this little group. Cool. You guys are terrific. Small is sometimes yeah. good, right? Small and mighty. Yeah, that's how it we is. Like it. Mighty. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Bye.